Good evening. Uh, I'm Diane Sayre, and this is the Friday New York Symposium with Diane Sayre. I am a LaRouche Independent candidate for U.S. Senate, challenging Chuck Schumer in 2022. And you just heard uh, soprano Michelle Aaron uh, with some of my friends singing the Laudate Dominum from the Mozart uh, Vespers. Uh, we're going to have a very important and timely discussion tonight on the question of drug legalization. As people uh, are probably aware, it's just been discovered by the people who put together figures on such things that between April of 2020 and April of 2021, there were 100,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States. And it's exactly at this moment that Senator Chuck Schumer, Ron Wyden, and Cory Booker have chosen uh, for their push to legalize marijuana nationwide. I don't think they'll stop at that. I read the bill and I can um, this afternoon, or at least the proposal, I think it's still under discussion. Hopefully I won't judo this program by showing it to you but you can just see the, um, what it looks like here. Um, Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act. And um, I will say of their main obsession in this is how to make money and how to regulate the taxation and so on. Uh, they claim that they are very eager to expunge records of uh, people, poor people, minorities who have minor possession charges uh, and that this bill is supposed to be for their benefit. I sincerely doubt it. And I thought what was noteworthy is in this entire thing, there is not one word about uh, rehabilitation or, or drug treatment. So, um, let me see if I can get myself back now. Um, yeah. So it's really a fraud and it's because the system is collapsing. And I think Dennis Small will go through more of this uh, in terms of the economic magnitude of the drug trade. What I would just like to say is that as people are probably aware because you probably noticed we are experiencing hyperinflation the cost of fuel the cost to heat one's house depending on whether you use oil gas or electricity is expected to increase by anywhere from six percent to fifty percent for most american homeowners the price of food in the last year has gone up by 32 percent uh apparently 160,000 active duty enlisted service members in the United States are experiencing food insecurity. I think that's really alarming and tragic, uh, but that is the state of affairs in this country. Now, what I wanted to just briefly discuss, and then I'll introduce the whole panel is, why this is really wrong and a little bit about Lyndon LaRouche's conception of physical economy and what the economy is supposed to measure and why we have a government and what our government is supposed to be dedicated to. And I'm just going to share my screen with you again here. Um, let's see here. Yeah. So I'd like to remind everybody that in the preamble of the United States Constitution, it says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Now, a population that has 100,000 drug overdoses, which has nations on our southern border where drug, cartel, drug gangs have more advanced weapons than their own military, like Mexico or in the Caribbean in, in Haiti, um, 
this is disrupting our domestic tranquility and our common defense and most emphatically is a violation of the general welfare um, the well-being of our society and if you have to live in fear you do not have liberty and your children are not going to have liberty and that is really what we are facing a kind of um, lawless society where there is no value on human beings and what we uh, contribute. Now, I wanted to show you this, the Hoover Dam, because what Lyndon LaRouche said and what flies in the face of what everyone is teaching with this environmentalist uh, nonsense, this Green New Deal about uh, how human beings are just a cancerous tumor on the planet, and if you exhale, you're polluting the earth, and, and so on. And actually, the opposite is true, that human beings are the only species which have the capacity to transform our species and to transform nature by virtue of being in the image of the creator. We are creative. This dam is just one example, but I love this photograph because it's beautiful and because it also shows the power. I mean, think about how large you can see the little automobiles driving on the highway over on the side of the picture. So how tiny is a human being relative to this magnificent structure? But human beings created it. It manages the water. It provides electricity. It provides irrigation that is what human beings are supposed to do we actually improve nature by virtue of our creativity which is a function of our mind that is our mind is the most important resource that we have and that is why you don't want to do things to your mind that destroy it here's another picture again uh, something that's fairly new, which is using laser technology to do advanced cutting of metals where you get a much smoother cut. Uh, now they use lasers in surgery. This is an incredible amount of power. And the idea of human economy is to increase man's power, man's ability to transform nature. So what does it mean when you declare that drug money is gonna be part of your GDP. How can you call money generated by selling drugs a benefit to your economy when actually it is destroying the thing that allows you to be productive? Similarly with prostitution or gambling of, or these other things, it's really a fraud. Money has no intrinsic value gaining money from doing things that destroy your ability to be creative and to make life better for yourself and future generations should not be considered economic gain. So here in New York, uh, we have, they legalized commercial recreational marijuana this past April. And one thing I, I'm hoping that people in New York watching this program will do is opt out. Uh, this is the website for the Office of Can Cannabis Management for the state of New York. You have until December 31st, December 31st of this year, that's coming right up for cities, towns, and villages to opt out. Uh, that doesn't mean that pot would be illegal. People possess it and, and so on, but it means that you can make sure that you don't have dispensaries for cannabis sales or have lounges for cannabis consumption in your town. I will also say if anyone who thinks that this is about some little something or other, if you read the text of the Schumer bill, when they talk about small dispensaries, they're starting with $20 million. I don't know who makes $20 million in their first um, their first shot at starting a business. And what is going to be the case is that big pharma, big tobacco, uh, big alcohol, all the monopoly companies that are destroying our population uh, for the benefit of a few billionaires are going to be the same ones running this. So please don't have any illusions that it's going to help the little guy. 
Uh, now, very, very important. If your city or town or village does not opt out by December 31st, they will automatically be opted in. Once you opt in, you can never leave. That is, if your town misses the opportunity to opt out, you can never get out. You're in it forever. In New Jersey, if you opt in, you're in for five years, then you have another option. But this is very important in New York. If you opt out and you decide, oh, gee, we really want to uh, destroy the minds of our children and have this thing in our town, then you can opt in at any point. So frankly, everybody should just be safe, opt out, and if you want to have it later, you can. Now, I included this letter, uh, which is, I thought, a very excellent model letter for opting out. Um, I guess it's the, the municipality or town of Mayo Pack, New York, and uh, it's signed by various uh, people in the town urging uh, that the town opt out. Uh, and they say, as you are aware, this became law in March, uh, et cetera. It is the opinion of the Putney, Putnam County Legislators Health, Social, Educational, Environmental Committee that since the new Cannabis Control Board is not yet operational and its regulations have not even be, begun to be discussed. Do you realize that? They don't even know what the rules and regulations of this body are yet, and they want people to opt in. Um, it is prudent for all villages, towns, and cities in New York to opt out until more is known. And I'll just cite a few things that they cite on the second page of their letter. For your consideration below are some of the research findings from communities in other states that have marijuana dispensaries. Youth aged 13 to 17 living close to the dispensaries and exposed to marijuana advertising were more likely to report their intention to use marijuana. Young adults living within a four mile radius of a dispensary are more likely to use marijuana and more likely to use it heavily and experience more problems related to its use. Home prices within a 0.36, so about a third of a mile area of a new dispensary fall by three to 4% on average. In addition, while states that have retail marijuana dispensaries have higher rates of marijuana impaired driving, hospitalizations for marijuana poisonings and hospitalizations for marijuana dependence, it's unclear how close the proximity to dispensaries impacts these consequences. And a community's decision to opt out sends a message that the community does not endorse getting high for fun and that patients and additional data are needed as opposed to experimenting with their families. So uh, that is just one example of a letter. Um, there we go, of a letter uh, on on how to opt out. So I would really urge everybody, you all live somewhere, uh, to get your town, village, municipality uh, to pass a resolution opting out of this and to do it immediately. We only have until December 31st. And if you don't do it by that time, you will never be allowed to do that. Now, uh, Jose, if you could just put everyone up on the screen, I'd like to introduce all of our speakers. And let me just say, as always, participation in the SARE for Senate Friday Symposium does not constitute endorsement of my candidacy or any candidacy. And it is not always the case, although I'm sure that I will agree with much of what is said by my speakers this evening. I may not agree with everything that is said and we may disagree and that's fine. There is far too little opportunity in today's society for people to have public disagreements and debates and talk things through. So I'll just tell you who's here, um, and then we will begin with Dennis Small. But we have Dennis Small, who is the board of executive director who is the chairman of the National Institute of Medicine and Policy, and who has been a longtime collaborator of LaRouche and Associates of Lyndon LaRouche on the War on Drugs. Uh, we have Bishop Jethro James, who is the pastor of Paradise Baptist Church, um, 
and he is the president of the Newark North Jersey Committee of Clergy. And we have David Ev Evans, whose practice is in addiction law, and he's a citizen advocate on drug and alcohol policy issues and the founder of CIVEL, C I V E L, Cannabis Industry Victims Educating Litigators. So again, participation here does not constitute endorsement of my campaign, but we really urgently want people to have access to this discussion. So with that, I would like to introduce Dennis Small, who will give us a sense of the overall situation with Dope Incorporated. Right. Thank you very much, Diane. I'm very happy to be here to be part of this discussion process. <clears throat> I, I think there is a wave of uh, response going on internationally to policies that people are finally realizing are completely destructive of their populations. Everything from India, the news from today is that the Modi government has actually withdrawn a very bad policy, which was <clears throat> destroying the agricultural sector of his country. And he simply withdrawn the bill because there was so much outrage over this. Uh, I think we have a situation in the United States and in New York State in particular, where uh, moving off such initiatives, such as the dispensary issue that Diane just raised, it is absolutely possible for the state of New York to deliver the famous shot heard around the world, but to create such a ruckus on this question of pot legalization <clears throat> and legalization federally that Schumer will be faced with the alternatives of either abandoning this bill or seeing himself voted out of office. And I would enjoy very much to watch him try to make that decision between those two options. The reason I say this is because the, the drug situation is out of control. And once people get a sense of this and realize it and where it's coming from, um, I think there is going to be quite an explosion about this. There have been many lies about pot in particular, but drugs in general. I can't possibly go through all of them and dispense with them tonight, but among them are the idea that it's not harmful, the idea that if you could just lower the price enough, you would get it out of the hands of criminals and people wouldn't you know, use it so much and so on and so forth, that we've tried the war on drugs and failed, so you can't do it that way. They're all lies. And I think that the best way to approach this is not <clears throat> going after each argument in particular, but let's look at the big picture. The big picture as Lyndon LaRouche uh, presented in a book he commissioned back in the 1970s called Dope Inc. Uh, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of some of the, doing some of the research for that along with other co-authors. The picture on drugs that we presented there was that the drug trade was being run from the top by an international single unified cartel financially organized around the laundering of hundreds of billions of drug dollars. And we traced this back historically to the opium wars. We traced it forward and we demonstrated that that was in fact the case, that this was run centrally. It's not a bunch of individual guys on a corner or peasants in a country or middlemen shipping drugs. It is run from the top by the major banks of Wall Street in the city of London. And only occasionally this has come out into the public view, such as, for example, in the famous Levin hearings before the Senate, where it was demonstrated and shown that none other than HSBC Bank was caught with their hand in the cookie jar for some $60 billion in laundering of uh, Sinaloa cartel money, knowing exactly what they were doing. And they got the uh, slap on the wrist after they pulled their hand out of the cookie jar. And I can guarantee you that both hands are back in the cookie jar and it's far more than $60 billion. Let me show you how big this really is. If I could have the first slide, Jose. This is calculations which we have just completed a couple of weeks ago with a new study on dope ink in the 21st century. This looks at using official statistics from uh, the State Department and from the UN's Office of uh, uh, Drug and, and Criminal Activity, putting together a picture of the total amount of physical production of each of these four drug categories, marijuana, opiates, cocaine, and amphetamine type synthetics. That's what ATS stands for. And <clears throat> what you can then do is calculate what the sale 
uh, value of this is for the street price of each of these drugs and get an idea of the potential revenue generated per year for Dope Incorporated by this drug trade. Now, back when we first published the book, it was three, four hundred billion dollars a year. In the year 2000, our estimates were five hundred and forty seven billion dollars per year. The last study that we did was statistics for 2007, and it was $818 billion a year. Our best estimate, using the same methodology that we use throughout, is that today the total yearly take of drug money is $1.5 trillion. Now, you'll notice if you look at this that the lion's share, over 50%, is marijuana and opiates and cocaine and amphetamine type synthetics are actually a distant second and third and fourth. So marijuana is not a minor player in this. It's actually the, uh, the heart and soul of the drug trade because it's also the way that people get addicted and pulled in <clears throat> on many other drugs as well, um, including now by lacing a lot of the marijuana with things like fentanyl and other drugs. But even if that were not done and it were pure, it does lead in exactly the way it always has because it is run from the top by a single unified cartel. Now, let me just run through a couple of other graphs. The next one shows you what's going on with opium. And you can see this is the area cultivated uh, going back to 1980 through the present. Uh, it has its ups and downs, but it's basically ups over this century. Very little is eradicated. Um, that's the area. <clears throat> that's that's harvested. In the next one, you'll see what a lot of this opium goes to is the production of opioids. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, now today, that includes the famous oxycontin and also fentanyl. Uh, now are being produced also synthetically. And what this shows you here is the number of users in the green bar worldwide of opioid abuse. That is to say, in 2019, uh, you had over uh, 60 million users uh, internationally. And you can see the huge jump that goes from 2016 forward. And this maps very closely to what Diane was just referring to, which is the sharp rise in deaths uh, from drug abuse in the United States, which is a large part of this international problem. And on the question of uh, opioid abuse, it's in particular fentanyl deaths, which have led to this jump. You have 100,000 deaths per year now going on. The cumulative total over the course of the century is millions of people who have been killed by drugs, about 9 million over the 20 years so far of this century. Um, the next slide talks about marijuana. And this is something that takes a little bit of use and lo uh, looking at and, and getting used to, but I'll just give you the big picture here, which is that the big lie is that if uh, you legalize drugs, oh, we'll lower the price and that'll take the profitability out of the whole thing. Well, guess what? Lowering the price of drugs has been the marketing strategy of Dope Inc. since its inception. They have been deliberately lowering the price of marijuana, cocaine, and heroin over decades for the purpose of expanding the market. And this is exactly what's happened. You can see the price in blue going down, uh, starting in the uh, about 1990, dropping down to a quarter of what it was uh, back at that point. And the use, the total quantity used rising, as you can see in the red, uh, the red curve here. I've associated this as it in fact is associated uh, in the real world with the policy of decriminalization, medical use of marijuana, and recreational use of marijuana that was implemented in the United States. Decriminalization began in 1973 with Oregon, and you can see what began to happen with the, uh, in particular when the medical use of marijuana began with California, first in 1996, within two decades, the majority of U.S. states had adopted the policy and look at what happened with consumption. Now with recreational drugs that begins in 2012, uh, you have a situation which is zooming out of control in terms of overall consumption of marijuana, especially in the United States, not only, but especially. 
the 40 out of 50 states in the United States now have some form of decrim medical or recreational use of marijuana. And the key thing that the Schumer bill is designed to do, as Diane pointed out, is to legalize the flow of the drug dollars. That's what they say. Quote from the draft bill, state compliant cannabis businesses will finally be treated like other businesses and allowed access to essential financial services like bank accounts and loans. That means that the banks will finally have access to the legal processing of drug dollars coming from marijuana sales for the process of laundering it now legally into the entire financial system. And this is the key objective and to increase uh, consumption and production. The next slide is gonna show you something that uh, you may find shocking, which is that the marijuana of 1980 is not the marijuana 40 years later. It is four to five times more potent. The THC content on average today has risen from around 4%, which it was before, to 15%, three and 4%, to 15%. It's four to five times higher. Uh, and the impact of this on the population is very clear. The consuming uh, public has grown uh, substantially. The next slide will show you the prevalence of use of marijuana in the United States. Prevalence means simply uh, what percentage of the population, age 15 to 64, admits to using marijuana. And you can see that it may be 5% in Europe and 2 and 3% uh, worldwide or 4% worldwide. In the United States, it's pushing 15%. The prevalence matters, as you'll see in the next slide, of the other drugs. Again, the United States is off the charts, uh, although the prevalence rates are not as high as marijuana, which is 15%. Opioids, it's getting up towards 4%, cocaine, ATS, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what you're looking at is a, the United States being the, the leader in the world of the drug addiction problem. That's the simple fact of the matter. And the consuming public in the United States are the principal victims of this international drug cartel, which is making about $2 uh, trillion a year off the drug trade. I said $1.5 trillion before. That's true, uh, but I don't include in the graphics because it's still very hard to quantify a whole new area of NPS's new psychoactive substances and other synthetics, which includes a lot. You can have, for example, synthetic cannabis now. And there are approximately 1,000 uh, uh, new psychoactive drugs in existence. They're creating about 80 a year, and they're not illegal because there are new chemical compounds which have not yet been made illegal. By the time the authorities catch up with them and make them illegal, and there are that many tens of thousands of more people dead, uh, they've invented new ones. So you've got an overall problem here. You've got a big international criminal apparatus and marijuana is just the storefront of this operation. And Chuck Schumer is Wall Street's pretty boy to try to sell a business which is producing $2 trillion a year in blood money. Now that's the simple fact of the matter. And it cannot be sugarcoated no matter how much you talk about the rights of poor, you know, uh, minorities that are being discriminated against by being jailed so much. That is undoubtedly true. But the problem is not that the drugs are, are illegal. The problem is we have a society which is a dead end for most people. And on the consumer side, besides convincing people that there's no risk, which is a lie, you then have the active promotion of drugs and entire layers of the society who have been denied a future and are therefore engaging in a form of either rapid suicide, like killing themselves that day, or slow suicide by taking drugs. And these are the so-called deaths of despair, which we know have swept the country. Let me conclude with one graphic, which in one sense is the most telling. And that is the factors affecting the prevalence of US opioid abuse. And this could apply to any drug category, but they did a simple cal calculation. This is, this is uh, um, from, from official statistics by surveys that were run. What correlates with opioid abuse? Well, it's not whether you're white, Hispanic, or black. That's all about the same. It's not if you're in high school, college, or not. But 
it is whether you have a job or not. It's the economy, stupid. It's the fact that you have no job, no future, you have nothing to look forward to, you cannot provide for your family, and the only way out, uh, people are led to believe, is by abusing opioids. And that's where the deaths come from. And that's, that's by far and away, it's twice the prevalence of every other area. Same thing is happening with countries around the world that produce the drugs. They are also victims of this. There are millions of people in countries around the world that are virtual slaves of the drug trade because they have no future. They have no possibility of a uh, viable uh, uh, job and they're driven into the only thing available. The solution on all of this is exactly what Diane was talking about at the beginning. We have to turn the entire world financial system and economic system around the way Lyndon LaRouche always talked about. And there now is a possibility to do this with the United States joining with China's Belt and Road Initiative, which by the way, today had its eighth anniversaries of its announcement uh, by Xi Jinping. That will create the circumstances in which the Hoover dams become just a small component of the kinds of modern breakthroughs which are possible, where people have jobs, Third world countries become developing countries. You fill them with infrastructure projects. You wipe out the drug trade by providing alternatives as well as all of the necessary police uh, and seizures and other measures. And in the United States, you, you deal with this by providing people with a future as well as prosecuting very aggressively drug crimes. And that has to start at the top. It has to start with throwing in jail the drug bankers that are pulling in, they're raking in $2 trillion a year of drug money, throw some of them in jail, and that will help reverse the inequities of minorities that are now sitting in jail. That would be my proposal on that front. I'll leave it at that, and the rest can come up in the discussion period. Great, thanks very much. I do just have to disagree with one thing that you said, which is you called Schumer a pretty boy. <laughs> And I wouldn't describe him that way, but at any rate, thank you either, very much. Either in, a, either in aesthetic uh, features or his age, either, right? <laughs> right. So now we will hear from David Evans, um, Addiction Law Practice. Go ahead and welcome. Nice to have you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I want to just start off by uh, getting rid of a premise, uh, and the premise is, is that there are uh, thousands of minority members languishing in jail, uh, either local or state or federal prisons, uh, because of possession of personal use of marijuana. That's absolutely untrue. And uh, it is something that the marijuana industry puts out. Uh, I've done the research. Uh, and uh, we have a paper published on it looking at all the data over a period of years. I've also been a criminal defense attorney in New Jersey since 1974. I was a public defender in Newark. I have never known anybody to go to jail in New Jersey for possession of small amounts of marijuana. Uh, if you are caught with a small amount of marijuana, you can get what's called a conditional discharge. Basically, if you stay out of trouble for six months, the court will administratively drop the charge against you. Uh, if you get a record, you can get your record expunged by going on a state website. Uh, you don't even need a lawyer to do this. So this is a myth that has gotten a lot of attention and a lot of people believe it, but it's just simply not true. Um, so civil is the cannabis industry victims educating litigators. We are that us, we do not have any trust in the government to deal with the drug problem. And we feel that the best way to go after the, in this case, the marijuana industry is through litigation. We've just seen an example with the Rittenhouse case where despite all kinds of public pressures and lobbying and money and media reports, uh, when it came down to a jury making a decision, they were able to make a decision and not subject to a lot of that pressure, whether you agree with the decision or not. Uh, it is uh, a place where uh, people supposedly come into court, uh, they can be heard, where evidence can be heard, uh, and where uh, the little guy, uh, and I've mostly represented plaintiffs, gets their day in court and has the power of the court to make the other side give over uh, information. Uh, so what we are doing is we are promoting 
uh, lawsuits against the marijuana industry in several areas. First of all, medical marijuana. Uh, it is another complete myth that marijuana is medicine. Uh, we only choose something to be medicine in the United States if it goes through the FDA approval process. We're all familiar with that because of COVID. Uh, anything that has not gone through that process that is used to treat uh, human disease uh, is not legally a medicine. Uh, the, the scientific proof for marijuana medicine is very, very thin. Um, it has been looked at. I've written on it extensively. Uh, and so uh, it is, I consider it to be medical malpractice to give marijuana to anybody for any illness. Um, the other one is product liability. The marijuana industry has not been regulated, uh, despite what they may claim. Uh, but in terms of product quality and things like that, they're not very well regulated. Uh, they are full of contaminants, pesticides, fungus, mold. Uh, we have done a paper on this showing time and time again that uh, states that have, in, in quotes, regulated marijuana are really doing a very poor job. The main problem is that the laws that implemented the legalization did not appropriate enough money for the uh, bureaucrats to set up a good regulatory scheme. Uh, New York is one exception to that because they did require, I believe it was uh, $20,000 just to get a license. Uh, and that at least provided some uh, funds to do that. Um, but the regulation of marijuana is, is very, very loose, very poorly done. Uh, the marijuana industry has a lot of influence because they donate a lot of money to politicians. Politicians accept the money because they're told the marijuana is harmless, that it's not addictive, it's just a plant. And the problem is that the marijuana industry has more money than we do to get that message out. But one way we can get that message out is through litigation. Uh, this is what was done with the tobacco industry, the tobacco industry and the opiate industry. The marijuana industry is filing, the, uh, working on the same game plan that those industries have done. Uh, the big tobacco lawsuit, which was a racketeering lawsuit, uh, the judge that decided that case wrote a 1,600-page opinion. Uh, if you take the word tobacco out of that uh, opinion and you insert the word marijuana in, it's a perfect match. Everything that she said that the tobacco industry did to push their products, they declared it to be uh, beneficial for your health. When I was a kid, there were advertisements that so many doctors smoke luckies. Smoking was a good way to lose weight. It soothed the throat. Uh, they said it, that tobacco was not addictive and so forth. Uh, so the opiate, the marijuana industry is doing the same thing. The opiate industry did it also recently. Uh, and what brought them down was litigation. The government was unable to control them because of uh, campaign donations and money. Uh, during the Obama administration, there was a, a bill that passed Congress unanimously restricting the ability of the DEA to go after uh, pill uh, manufacturers. Uh, the opiate company spent $12 million getting that bill passed. And of course, nobody would touch that now because now everybody understands what happened with opiates. I've been fighting against drug legalization for a couple of decades. And we've been telling people over and over again that if you loosen up your attitude towards drugs, you're gonna get epidemics and we now have an opiate epidemic that's killing 100,000 people a year. And it's all because we began doing things like harm reduction, needle exchange, uh, things like that, that uh, took the onus off drug users uh, and allowed them to do what they, what they do. Um, we also have uh, gotten away from mandatory treatment. Uh, I ran the drunk driving program in New Jersey for several years. I was very tough on treatment, man, man, mandated treatment. If you didn't go to treatment, you went to jail. Uh, I had the lowest recidivism rate for any drunk driving program in the United States. We did a five-year study on that. So all this loosening attitude, the um, you know thing that it's hurting minorities, uh, legalizing drugs, legalizing marijuana is going to hurt the minority community more than anything else. The last thing that they need, the last thing that poor uh, communities need is more drugs put into their system. So we're looking at medical malpractice. We're looking at product liability. We're looking at environmental claims. Marijuana growing is tremendously destructive to the environment. Uh, also, there's a big problem with marijuana growers in California. They're stealing water 
during periods of drought. You have to remember that marijuana companies to begin with are criminals. Every single one of them are criminals because what they're doing is in violation of federal law. So if you set up an industry run by criminals, this is what you're going to get. Uh, and uh, they, for the personal injury lawyers, they're low hanging fruit because they've been so reckless uh, in, in promoting their products and not making sure uh, that people are given proper warnings that there's an awful lot of damage. We have a tremendous uh, influence right now of young people who have uh, incurred psychosis. I was just on the phone with mothers in Colorado who now want to sue the industry because their children have had their brains damaged by this high potency marijuana. Um, so there's uh, medical malpractice, personal injury. There is uh, RICO, the racketeering federal lawsuits. You can go after them on that basis. Environmental lawsuits, also server liability. I mean, we're well aware that uh, a, a bar can't serve somebody who's visibly intoxicated. They have not been applying that law to marijuana stores. People can go in there and get stoned out of their minds uh, and go and drive a car. And we've seen an uptick in drug driving and fatalities due to marijuana in the states that have legalized, uh, legalized marijuana. Uh, the other big thing is with birth defects and problems with pregnancy. Um, they, uh, the marijuana is in Colorado. Uh, there was a study there um, that 66% of them were recommending marijuana to pregnant women, which is uh, something that can be very harmful to the unborn child. The American College of Gynecologists has recommended against this, that anybody thinking about being pregnant uh, or getting involved in pregnancy, and this includes the males because it can damage your sperm, um, uh, should not get involved in, in marijuana. So what we are doing is that we are educating the public. We're publishing legal articles to attorneys. We are in touch with the various marijuana victim organizations around the United States. Uh, and we are now starting to get lawsuits against the marijuana industry. There were over a thousand lawsuits against uh, the opiate industry. Uh, and we hope in time uh, that we're going to have a similar process with, uh, with the uh, marijuana. Uh, as soon as attorneys start getting substantial awards for uh, suicides caused by marijuana, mental illness caused by marijuana, birth defects caused by marijuana, uh, the legal community is going to start paying attention. So you can go on our website. You can contact us through our website. It's civil, C-I-V-E-L dot org. Uh, that has more information and some other information about marijuana. It's civil, C-I-V-E-L dot org. And also a uh, good source of information is Americans Against Legalizing Marijuana. That's A-A-L-M dot info, A-A-L-M dot info. Uh, if you go at the little bars on the right-hand side, uh, you can open up, you'll find all kinds of documents and papers about this. And I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Great. Thank you very much, David. That uh, You just said a lot, and I think a lot that's new to people and new to me. And there are questions coming in. Uh, Bishop James, if you would go ahead. I know you've been in this fight and been on the ground seeing the situation. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Diane. And David's 100% correct. Um, what we've seen, and, and I was sort of the guy that invited Phil Murphy uh, to my church for my MLK day. He had just become the governor-elect, and uh, I called him out on marijuana, and everybody said I was a bad guy. I had met with him prior um, to that day and said to him when he announced that he was going to legalize marijuana, that it would be devastating to the African-American community. Um, and again, um, they really said it all. Um, I don't know anyone who, who went to prison for any real time for smoking a joint. Um, these were dealers, these were criminals, um, um, some were killers. Um, those are the people that are in jail, not for smoking a joint. So they put out this lie and so many people in my community bought it about we're going to let people out. What have I seen um, in New Jersey? First and foremost, although I called the governor out, 
um, on his really first day or just prior to him taking office. He promised he'd get it done in 100 days. We're so proud. It's been four years and it's still not done. Questions I'm raising at the attorney general's office right now. And as I said, Dave's pretty much summed it all up. Um, if you're a police officer here in New Jersey, um, you're treated as the same if you have an alcohol problem, so you cannot carry a weapon. Um, what does that do to the low number of African-American police officers in this state? It's mandatory drug testing. We already had a case uh, here in Newark where a young mother smoked. She happened to be a school teacher, an educator. Um, the baby was born with THC poisoning. Um, that has child welfare involved. And so there's a case against her. The other child she has has been removed from the home and is now um, with the grandmother. Because she was a non-tenured teacher, the school board has fired her because you cannot be around children with a child welfare case here in the state of New Jersey. Um, all child welfare, we used to call it DIFUS, now it's DCP and P um, here in the state. Um, the money comes from the federal government. So you will automatically have a child welfare case open on you if you smoke. And God forbid, if your child is born and has some um, mental or physical disorder because of THC. In addition, as Dave stated, I've gone to the attorney general and I've asked that since you legalized it in this state, um, can money be set aside for the legalization of marijuana? Can money be set aside for the legalization of marijuana for the lawsuits for these babies that are going to be born um, with that problem? Um, I've, 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 I've talked with um, all the police chiefs in the state. All of them are against it because they're gonna lose folks. Transport of New Jersey, that's your trains, your buses, um, your planes, um, you cannot work for them if you smoke marijuana. It's in your system for 30 days. There's mandatory drug testing. I've also worked um, and a retiree from PSEG. Um, PSEG, of course, you know, is not just New Jersey. You got PSEG, Long Island. There's mandatory drug testing. The last thing that you want, the very last thing that you want is uh, someone coming in, um, running a 10 kV line of fixing your furnace or hot water heater, and uh, they just smoke the joint. You cannot work on the ports because they're federal. Um, you will not be a longshoreman, mandatory drug testing. You will not drive a bus. You will not uh, be a conductor uh, on a train. So it's going to devastate um, the quote unquote good paying jobs that we have in the African-American community. We've had another case, um, DOG, Department of Justice, a uh, young man who um, was a prison guard, had anxiety problems. Thank God he had over 20 years in. Went to a doctor, they prescribed quote unquote medical marijuana. Uh, he was tested, tested positive for marijuana. Um, cannot work in any form of law enforcement, but especially in federal um, facilities. Um, so he's out now on permanent disability. We've had a doctor abuse the medical side uh, out of Trenton, New Jersey. He wrote a million dollars worth of prescriptions for medical marijuana um, within two months. And of course, he got caught. There was just too much going on. And so we've seen the abuse already on, quote unquote, the medical side. Now, with the legalization and the lies being told, where are you going to work? My community will be so devastated. We know in this nation, there's a shortage of truck drivers because of COVID, CDL. Um, you will not get a commercial driver's license if you smoke marijuana. Uh, we look at what's going on right now, and, and I just uh, read it today. The American Heart Association has found that um, 
men especially, men especially, 35 to 50 years old, um, have more heart attacks if they have smoked marijuana in their youth. Again, they've talked about it. Um, if you are a constant smoker of marijuana, this is the medical side of it, constant smoker of marijuana starting from the age 16, by the time you're 25, um, you probably will not be able to use any of the uh, the Viagras of the world and the, the, the other things because it will not help you. The um, psychosis that they're talking about uh, in our children. Again, in New Jersey, not one um, medical, uh, one, I'm sorry, uh, a shop has opened up um, for legal cannabis for the recreation piece. The opt-out, New Jersey has an opt-out system. Over 60 municipalities have opt out, including Governor Phil Murphy's municipality. And so if the governor or his family wants to get a joint, he's gonna probably have to come to a neighborhood where mostly my people are to buy his joint. Uh, the reality is this is strictly about greed. Um, I've talked to them about, we have a water problem in New Jersey, as you know, um, especially in your larger cities. Newark has the same problems as Flint, Michigan. When I asked the question, um, what about the runoff from the marijuana grow houses, um, no one has said anything. The environment um, will be devastated. Uh, as I looked at and what I've seen daily talking, I sit on the board of a, a few hospitals in the state, one private, one public. And the reality is that one of the biggest things we're seeing are children now, pediatric poisonings from marijuana. Then the question comes for the edibles. In the state of New Jersey, um, there is nothing dealing with the edibles. One of the things that I feared, um, and it happened in a very well-to-do Bergen County community, that some of the kids brought some edibles to school and they all wound up in one of the uh, richer areas of New Jersey. They wound up at a hospital in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Um, the edibles are geared and packaged to children. The edibles are geared and packaged to children. I've asked the question, who regulates the edibles? Um, Food and Drug Administration? No one in this state, including someone from the Attorney General's office, has been able to tell me who regulates the that industry. And so when we look at what this is going to do, um, you're, you're really devastating the African-American community. They talked about small shops being set aside. Um, there is no set-asides legally in the state of New Jersey. So women and minorities will not be part of an industry that you need millions of dollars to get started. And so um, they, 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 they have just out, out, you know, people say, well, they haven't told the truth. They outright lied to the community. We know that this is all about money. Um, in addition to that, the municipalities um, that have opt out, we had a case in the city of Patterson. The municipality, the council opt out. And the mayor vetoed what the council did. And so, of course, that's going to wind up in court because he has a, doesn't have the right to veto um, what the council has done. And so we're seeing 70 percent increase in children that are poisoned by what's not even legal yet in the state, edibles. We had just this Halloween, children were given edibles as part of their trick-or-treating. Thank God that the m marijuana was caught and the child didn't need it. But as you probably know, that just three months ago, a three-year-old got a hold of some edible jelly beans and he has been in a coma from that day to this. So it's an out and out lie. 
Um, the reality is that it does nothing but finish devastating the African-American community. You will not work for anybody that you need to drive for. You will not be a police officer. You cannot work for major corporations like PSENG. Um, you can not work uh, on the ports. We're talking about a backup. Well, you know the ports are federal. If you have, if you receive food stamps, you can no longer receive any federal uh, subsidies. You cannot um, get rental assistance. And I could go on and on and on just because of conviction. Um, in Washington, D.C., um, Eleanor Norton Holmes, their congresswoman, because of so many people being evicted from public housing, is supporting Schumer and Cory Booker on this bill. Um, Cory has never, has never cared about the people of New Jersey. I know Corey when he came to New Jersey. I know him from his council. I know him from when he was the mayor of Newark. Corey has one of the best spin machines there are. But caring about the African American community or any community, Corey does not care. And, and that's a fact. Until we understand that a drug that causes heart attack, a drug in the African American community that will cause a brain damage, a drug that will have you losing uh, employment, um, a drug that will have you not being able to educate, a drug that will bring the black community more illegal drugs because folks are walking around in New Jersey right now and that not one store is open, but the black market is booming. Um, we cannot afford Chuck Schumer and Cory Booker. And like was said earlier, I would love to be there um, when somebody says, guess what? And then ask them the question, would you do this to your grandchildren? So that's my, my two cents. Anyone that wants to get in touch with me, I'm real easy to find. Um, you can Google me, Bishop Jethro James, Paradise Baptist Church. And I'm crazy enough because I've been around and done this nationally. You can call me on my cell phone, 973-941-3150. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, do we have Mr. Rathbone? I'm here. Oh, very good. I'm, so as you may know, mm -hmm. I... Suzanne sent me some of your slides, or Jose may have them as well if you want us to show anything, but uh, perhaps you would like to say a few words about what you've heard or anything else on this matter. Yes, thanks a lot for having me on. Uh, I really appreciate the information that's coming out now from you people because there's a dearth of it. It's, it's being suppressed everywhere else. Nobody's talking about it. The media is scared to death to say anything negative about marijuana because all their uh, associates will condemn them and criticize them. But uh, I've, I got into this thing very early as a parent in, in a high school near Dulles Airport that my kids were going to. Uh, I was reading the school newspaper and, and being a little alarmed by some of the goofy stuff that I was seeing, like feature articles on what's the best drugs available in the school. And at that time, I was coming from a perspective of a person who had graduated from high school when there was no such thing as drugs in the, in the schools. And I had the impression that uh, the safety that it prevailed then was still continuing over in my kids' schools. Wrong. They, they had uh, riots there where teachers were assaulted kids beating each other up, and, and they had to shut the schools down. I had shut that school down for two or three days to try to straighten things out. They had a, a, a hearing on what could have caused all this, and the hearing said drugs were being used and sold and fought over in the schools, and they were prevalent everywhere. Well, as a parent, when, when we heard this, uh, a couple other parents, we decided, well, this is an easy thing to fix. Uh, 
the drugs are illegal, we can just put the bad guys in jail. But who will let the kids be put in jail? Nobody. The parents don't want them. They'll defend their kids no matter how bad they are right till the end because that's the parental love that's in us. Uh, but anyway, we, uh, we decided uh, to try to do something. But the first people we were able to contact uh, on any kind of a formal basis was the LaRouge people. And, and Suzanne Klebe and myself and a couple of us got together and, um, and, and went to some government agencies. And uh, I don't know if you can see from uh, some of the documentation I submitted, uh, but uh, we went to, to Congress during the uh, confirmation hearings of William French Smith. That was uh, uh, Reagan's attorney general. And we testified at the end of the, the hearings there. They let us in. And, uh, and, and Biden himself was the uh, assistant uh, manager of that operation of the, the Department of Justice. Uh, the, the, uh, hmm, I forgot the name of it. But anyway, uh, the, the group that approves uh, uh, judicial appointees. And, and we were the last ones uh, to, to speak. And, 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 and the leader, which was Strom Thurmond at that time, and Joe Biden, which was the minority uh, head minority on that committee, came down to us and shook our hands and, and thanked us. There's there's a, 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 a record of it in the in the uh, journal, the congressional journal, um, and shook our hands and and because nobody was talking, saying anything about the harm of drugs back in those days. All they wanted to do was get money for their project. It was sickening. And, and so Joe Biden, bless his heart, he might be in trouble now, but he sure was a good guy back in those days. And he went on from there to, uh, to create the Office of Drug Control Policy, which was, was sorely needed. And until the Democrats got in there and, and pretty much uh, put it on, on reserve, uh, was doing some real good things. And, and they worked with us, and David Evans and myself uh, got together and, and, uh, and were trying to get the approval of student drug testing. The, the military had come back from the Vietnam War full of drugs, and that's where it all started exploding in the country. And, uh, and then it got bad in a number of areas like the transportation industry, and they started drug testing. Well... The, the military coming back from Vietnam, about a third of the military across all branches were full of drugs. And, and so uh, the uh, powers that be recognized how harmful this was and implemented uh, drug testing, uh, random drug testing, and it went from about a third of the military being whacked out on drugs at any one time down to only about 2% use, a remarkable reduction. And we thought, my goodness, if they do this for the military, why can't we do this in schools? But boy, was there a lot of opposition. And of course, uh, David Evans uh, really worked with us uh, on this thing and, and put together the amicus brief for a uh, Supreme Court case, the Earl's case, on student drug testing for uh, extracurricular students. But he also did one earlier. Uh, or worked with us earlier on getting the bill passed in Congress authorizing that. Um, up until that time, uh, the, the federal government pretended like it was doing something against drugs, said, well, you can talk to them about it, and, and you can have some, uh, um, maybe some uh, sniffer drug, uh, uh, dogs in there. But when it came time to actually doing something that would uh, definitively uh, uh, determine if a kid's in trouble, they weren't having any part of that. So we had a, a good sized fight getting that done, and we got it done in the, in the uh, No Child Left Behind Act, uh, the education bill. And, and after that, ONDCP then uh, uh, listened to us. We took that, that uh, the, the student drug testing issue to ONDCP. We had done it before, and, uh, and the previous Democratic administrations, they weren't going to touch it. And of course, we know why now all this discussion we've had of the, the influence of money um, uh, in the public policy. So they picked up on it in the, in the uh, Bush II 
administration, and and he even included a, a comment in the State of the Union message, uh, where he uh, he made the statement in there that student drug testing is saving lives, and that we we don't the reason we want to do it is because we love our children and don't want to lose them, and and that's was powerful. We're not hearing those kind of statements from public officials anymore. They've gone deaf, dumb, and blind to all of the the harm that's being done by the the prevalence of drugs in the in the, in the nation, especially among the kids, and especially with the marijuana. Um, well, I could go on and on on that, but uh, if if you'll show some of the uh, uh, information that I've submitted there, uh, you'll see my, the main one that um, I'm kind of proud of because I've been keeping track of the drug overdose deaths nationally uh, for a long time. Started this graph a long time ago, and maybe if somebody can put it up there, uh, as a result of the recent announcement that the, the latest year, the, the drug overdose deaths have reached 100,000. Uh, you can see on on the graph, if you'll display it up there, the steady progression starting out from t about uh, 79 for about the first 20 years, uh, pretty low, but increased a little bit. And it, this plots are exactly along with the, the graphs of the, uh, of the uh, information that Dennis Small showed us with the, with the amount of money being generated and, and the... Uh, pro-drug laws uh, prevailing, and, and now they got it to the point where uh, they're going to try to do away with the federal uh, prohibit, prohibition against uh, marijuana. That would be devastating if it gets done. But I live in Maryland, and Maryland picked up lock, stock, and barrel on this medical marijuana stuff, and, and a lot of the legislators, state legislators, who had the recommendations for uh, the state law to legalize medical marijuana. Uh, it, it was dictated to the legislators by these these uh, drug cartel managers, and then of course they were divvying up the the um, uh, uh, agreements on on who could um, start these businesses. And a, a number of the the st state legislators are part owners in the in the marijuana businesses, and of course. I don't know if, well, most all of you went through this thing with the uh, coronavirus thing, but they they thought it so ho uh, horrible that they wanted to shut down everything. But they did designate what are essential businesses. And among the essential businesses was the marijuana business, the liquor business, and and uh, the uh, and all the bad stuff that's addictive. And, and they shut down completely as not being essential the the faith, uh, faith business, the churches, and uh, and of course uh, that that shows you where the priorities are. These guys are so corrupted by the drug money. Well, uh, I've got several of these other things. I hope you can pass them around and let the people see uh, what we've documented. Uh, one of the closest things we've documented is Basket Case, Baltimore. Over there used to be one of the finest, safest, most beautiful cities in the, in the nation. And then the, the drug cartels got in there, got a hold of the politicians. Politicians abolished anything that would uh, uh, help keep uh, tabs on the drug industry. And, and now they, they've virtually eliminated their police forces. Uh, the the Little druggy thugs can just go into any business they want and, and and raid them, and nobody wants to put them in jail. So all of this stuff is leading toward more and more of the things the Reverend talked about: the impact on people, kids' brains, their bodies, uh, the violence that's going on among them, and uh, one of the big things, of course, is it suicides. Uh, suicides are jump, uh, jumping off the charts, but nobody wants to to uh, uh, ask about the impact of of um, drugs on these things, and and if you see the one that's on here now, uh, we we as the parent organizations uh, have raised the issue in a couple of full page ads in the Washington Times, 
uh, just before uh, Trump came into office. We're a little disappointed he didn't pick up on them. But one of the main things that's needed and, and is not being talked about, we say that Congress, uh, Congress should uh, mandate that all investigations of violent crimes include forensic drug testing of all criminal suspects to determine and publicize what mind-altering substance may explain the, quote, unknown cause, end of quote, of otherwise irrational violence. And, of course, that unknown cause, cause hits every newspaper uh, report of all these horrible things. They won't ask about marijuana. They don't believe there's anything wrong with marijuana. Uh, the the uh, journalist industry is full of marijuana users, as was pointed out in a book called High in America by Patrick Anderson. If you get a chance to get it, that's an eye-opener of how the, 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 the drug traffickers, the administration, and the, the uh, journalists, the media, all got together in there and uh, snorting cocaine and having a great time. Meanwhile, uh, suppressing any uh, hostile news toward uh, toward drugs. Anyway, uh, there's a, a bunch of other things we've got in there. We've documented pretty much, um, and I, I hope that uh, I hope that uh, Diane can um, continue to to make the drug problem, especially this marijuana problem, a part of her campaign. And 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 really. Uh, it's it's almost hoping against hope that any media will pick up what's been discussed today, but uh, uh, of course uh, we can always uh, pray. And that's what Pastor James is in favor of, uh, of us all doing. It's going to take that and more. And of course we've got the ultimate uh, solution to this thing, and it's like is pointed out in the book Dope Incorporated, the the uh, Opium wars, where the only way China finally got rid of the opium wars after two centuries was to put a bullet back in the head of uh, all the drug users and the drug pushers, and it went away. And today, China is probably uh, one of the least uh, drug-affected uh, countries in the world, and that's all documented in Dove Incorporated. So anyway, thanks a lot, guys, and uh, I hope this does some good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for everybody uh, who's been here. There's been several questions coming in. Some of them are related uh, on the question of the prisons. For example, someone said, well, if everybody in these prisons, since we have so many people in prison in the United States, close to 2 million um, and about 5 million others who are somewhere caught up in that system on parole, what what is the cause of all these people being in prison? Is it dealing or what is it? Uh, and and then someone asks, if we oppose legalization, can we prevent, uh, again, based on this idea that everyone's going to jail for small drug offenses, a system which allows people to be used for slave labor in priv a privatized prison industry? Um, and then I have a slightly different twist on this question, which is uh, perhaps for Dennis Small and others, uh, which is maybe there are other people who should be going to prison, which are not necessarily the users and dealers on the streets, but the people in the financial institutions, since I find it quite amazing that since 2008, not one single major banker has gone to jail. I don't think Bernie Madoff exactly counts. And we know when banks like HSBC get caught red-handed laundering billions and billions of dollars of drug money, they don't even name an individual. There's not even a person indicted for it. It's as if somehow the institution is a robot just functioning on autopilot. Um, so on all of these, perhaps first I'll go to David Evans and, and then we'll go from there. Well, I... I um... I've seen a lot of crime. I, I worked for 15 years for the Division of Addiction Services, setting up addiction treatment programs in prisons and in courts. And most people think that uh, being uh, uneducated, uh, drug addicted, alcoholic, or mentally ill causes crime. Uh, my perspective on that is that it causes you to get caught for crime. 
uh, the reason that there's so many uh, uneducated, drug addicted, mentally ill people in prison is because they're not very effective criminals. Um, I, I uh, have seen case after case where uh, somebody just does something stupid and gets caught for a crime and winds up in prison. So people that have half a brain uh, most of the time don't get caught, don't wind up in prison. Um, I, uh, I think it's very naive. Um, I've been working on prison reform for over 50 years. Uh, we now are going through another phase where people are talking about reforming the system. Uh, most people that are criminals are criminals and um, they have a criminal mindset. And it'd be like if we were at war with Russia and we captured Russians and tried to turn them into Eagle Boy Scouts, it's just simply not going to work. Uh, so you have to start off with that realization that the public needs to be protected from a lot of these people. They are capable of getting better. Uh, I've got uh, friends who are, uh, you know, recovered uh, uh, offenders. Uh, I think organizations like the Fortune Society in New York has done a great job. But I don't think we should be naive about the people that we're dealing with. Uh, I was a public defender in Newark for two years, and I met people that scared the hell out of me. I mean, literally. People that had no souls, they were just flat out, you know, murderers. Uh, so not to be naive about it. But I, I think the, the best thing to do for addicts is to treat them not in prison, but to get them into a treatment program right before they're released and then have extensive follow up because it takes a while for addiction treatment to take a hold on somebody. What time is supposed to come? Thanks. Bishop James, do you want to say something about this question? Yes, I, I think first and foremost, to to understand the justice system in the United States, um, unfortunately, just us, um, the the policing and court system, um, and 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 this is not a blame game. The fact is that um, my ancestors didn't come over on the Nina and the Penta and the Santa Maria. They came in the bowels of slave ships. Um, we've been second class citizens. Um, if you wanted to test the drug out, you gave it to prison populations, but especially those of color, that's real. That's our history, we can't get around it. And so um, that's one of the reasons um, drugs um, folks that sell drugs, I call it the underground economy, but it devastates the people. Um, it's people that won't work, and we'll look at this time. People that won't work, um, they took stimulus checks, um, and still there's jobs. They don't want them. They don't pay what they think they should pay. Um, and, and, and so... Uh, easy money. Marijuana is easy money on the street. You can buy from anyone. They are not going to have the overhead. The black market is going to be something else. And again, um, because my church is in Newark, um, did a, a career at PSENG, retired Newark, um, licensed social worker here in the state of New Jersey. Um, we've lost the moral high ground with our children, but especially in the African-American community. The other piece of it is poor kids can't get the best lawyers. Poor kids are going to go to jail. And then they fantasize on things that, that, that a lot of us look at. Um, and, you know, everybody wants to be um, Tony, uh, in, 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 in Scarface. Everybody wants to be, you know, a gangster. Um, then our society says you take bad boys, and I'm talking especially in my community, you take bad boys and to go to jail is a badge of honor, to shoot someone is a badge of honor. We have lost our moral high ground. And I don't know how we get it back, but marijuana only exacerbates the problem. And I too have seen some folks that scare the hell out of me. 
Thank you. Dennis Small, I think you probably have some thoughts and I have some as well. <laughs> One of the reasons I opened this show with music tonight, but uh, go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I want to thank the other fellow panelists. I've learned quite a bit and I think a lot of these initiatives are, are very productive. Um, Perhaps one of the things that distinguishes me from my fellow panelists is that I've actually been in jail. I've not visited them. I actually spent over two years in jail as a political prisoner along with Lyndon LaRouche. I was one of the people who was unjustly condemned for crimes I never committed as was Mr. LaRouche and spent some time in what for me was fortunately a low security uh, federal penitentiary, not so some of my colleagues who went to much nastier jails. But I can tell you one thing, I didn't see a single top banker or drug runner in jail. I mean, bankers, the ones who are actually behind this. I saw a lot of people of the sort that have been described who undoubtedly committed some sort of crime or other, but they're just the, the they're just the pawns in the game. They're the throwaways. They're the people who are being used by a well-coordinated, well-oiled machine run from the top by the people in the three-piece suits and they launder i mean just follow the money this isn't coming from nowhere this doesn't come together like a jigsaw puzzle with seven billion pieces around the planet it's being run from the top by a centralized coordinated financial apparatus which we documented in detail in, in dope incorporated and traced it all the way back to the opium wars uh, against china same banks same financial centers, same unregulated financial processes uh, run out of the city of London and now with a significant participation of, of, uh, of Wall Street banks as well. And everything falls into place around that. So if you're going to address this thing, uh, and we must, I think that all of the work that's being done is good, but it's none of it is going to actually function or work unless we stop the financial system which is producing this and which actually depends on drug money is addicted to drug money like a heroin addict is addicted to smack that is what the international financial system is you're talking about a speculative bubble of close to two quadrillion dollars and the drug trade is a cool two trillion per year it's only a small part of the total, but it is highly liquid cash and it's crucial and has been a key component of keeping this whole financial system afloat. That's not just uh, the LaRouche organization saying this. We said it first, but it has been repeated by Maria Antonio Costa of the head of the UNODC, where he talked about how banks would not have gotten out of the 2008 crash had it not been for drug money that was that was pumped through their veins to keep them going. So they're the ones that are actually behind this whole thing. And I think that it's crucial. And I would uh, you know, urge my fellow panelists to you know, put their, their, their experience and their, their uh, really good ideas to work in trying to figure out this aspect as well, is how do we actually go after these people? I think a, a very important part of this, say just two things more. One is the Glass-Steagall banking legislation which was passed under Roosevelt in 1933, and it provided for a strict separation of the banks. On the one hand, your commercial productive lending, which was backed by the government and the FDIC and so on and so forth. And on the other side, you had your investment banking that could engage in all of the speculative activity it wanted, except there was an absolute wall between the two. No government support for any of the speculative banking, which is, of course, where the drug trade comes in. That was. Uh, uh, a nail was put in that coffin in 1999, and that's also been a crucial part of the tremendous growth of the of the drug of the drug economy. Get back to Glass Steagall, you will put the entire system through bankruptcy reorganization, and you'll actually that's probably the single most effective thing you could do to uh, to put a stop to the financial flows behind the drug trade, which is what's moving it all. One final thought. I think even more significant than the financial side, as crucial as that is, is the cultural warfare aspect of this thing, which is what we're all beginning to address here, and which does have to do with the classical music that was played at the beginning. The, the opium war against China was waged as cultural warfare to destroy a nation, to enslave it to mind-altering drugs that destroyed the creative capability of the population. 
the opium war is being waged against the population of the United States and Europe today is exactly the same thing. Besides everything else that drugs do to your body and the physical addiction, it destroys your mind. It's designed precisely to make it impossible for the mind of human beings to engage in what is most distinctly human, which is creative, synthetic thinking that puts together new cause and effect explanations for a phenomena we see around us. What drugs do, starting with marijuana and all the way up the line, is that it shatters your, your mind's ability to put together a picture that's coherent. And this is a whole topic that would obviously require many, many hours of discussion. But I did want to put that on the table because I think that the solution on the cultural side lies in, lies in encouraging those activities precisely that encourage that creative capability. And, and classical music is certainly one of them. Thanks. What I wanted to say is that, I mean, there was a huge operation in the 1960s in the United States under the name of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which actually started at the right at the end or during World War II, but then uh, was run by the CIA, major banks, Hollywood, the news media. They called it the rock drug sex counterculture, where it wasn't just slipping LSD to someone on a university campus, but taking over the radio stations, creating the top 40, creating a culture of hedonism at the same time that you had the Vietnam War, where we were declaring ourselves the victor based on the number of people we killed, as opposed to uh, some kind of actual legitimate agenda like defeating Adolf Hitler, defeating fascism. Um, <clears throat> and we shut down our productive economy. It became, the idea was that we don't it's dirty to be a blue collar worker. It's dirty to be a farmer. You work with your hands. The really smart people figure out how to do things where they make money without doing any work. Um, or you become a service economy. And, and between the assassinations of the Kennedys, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, the Vietnam War, and this cultural onslaught, the optimism of the United States the progress that had occurred in the civil rights movement really uh, came to a grinding halt and got um, consumed by a kind of pessimism and small mindedness where people came to the conclusion that all I can really do is worry about myself. Act locally, be small, think about yourself uh, and it's obviously very destructive and there's no great happiness in doing that as there was happiness in figuring out how to get to the moon, figuring out how to cure diseases, figuring out how to build massive infrastructure projects that solve major problems for humanity. Um, and that's what we have to get back to. And one of the things that I find as a candidate talking to people is that uh, people have been you know, the saying been down so long, it looks like up to me. What people think they want is merely momentary survival. I would be so relieved if I could just get by without getting evicted or if I could just pay my next month's mortgage on time, as opposed to imagining what our cities and towns actually should look like, uh, that we should be planning new cities, we should be building new cities in the United States, uh, that we should be collaborating with China on a few projects uh, I have in mind, particularly Haiti, the development of Haiti, which would require them to recognize China instead of Taiwan, and also perhaps Puerto Rico, which is really part of the United States in some way, but it's treated as if it's, you know, incapable of governing itself, uh, has this financial control board type situation, but you have incredible things um, there, like the telescope, which has now been damaged. There's a science legacy there. Haiti uh, had a constitution that was largely inspired by uh, Alexander Hamilton. They were going to be another a, a brother republic uh, in this part of the world. So 
there's enormous potential and the drugs are destroying also entire nations. Look at Haiti right now with the drug gangs basically running the place, it's ungovernable. On China, what I wanted to say is, um, you know, we had a conversation in the, the chorus that I, I founded. Um, many of our accompanists are from um, China and I was asking one of them after the rehearsal about whether they had a drug problem in China, which is, a, you know, and he just said, uh, no, are you kidding? Uh, one, there's a very conscious idea that they suffered this humiliation for 100 years between the opium wars, the Japanese occupation, etc., and that's beneath their dignity to go back. He said, if somebody is even photographed, if they're out of the country and they're smoking a joint or something, some rock star, whatever, they come back to China, they are completely ostracized. No one wants to be seen with them. It's a complete cultural taboo. If you are doing that yourself, it's seen as sort of a destruction of society. And I think if the United States had the approach that we were going to be building the major infrastructure we needed, that the whole nation were actually engaged in figuring out how to establish a manned colony on Mars, 30 years from now, we were gonna develop fusion. I think you might have a similar cultural rejection of destroying your mind because you would recognize that the talents of every single person were actually needed to accomplish these tasks. Again, back to this question of the promotion of the general welfare. Uh, in the meantime, I think it is absolutely the case that we need to put some of these big money guys in jail. Uh, so those are some of my thoughts and I wanted to hear what else D has on his mind. You're asking about me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, I am. Well, to me, uh, the biggest opportunity we have is to, to uh, protect the kids within the schools. Uh, it's widely known that if you can get a, a kid up to about 21 years old, uh, before they get involved with these, these mind-altering substances, they, they will never have a problem, or if they do, it, going to be easy for them to break the problem so right now they've they've pretty much across the board uh official government agencies have have backed off of doing the health screening of the kids to protect them from the little pushers that are in the schools that's got to stop that it there has to be a federal mandate to make that happen because the money's too big to to uh to uh to, to, to get the local uh, politicians uh, off of them, off the kids' backs. So th that's the one thing that has to be done. The other one, and, and we listed in there, the federal government has to mandate, just like they did with alcohol and, and drunk driving, that when there's an accident, they have to be alcohol tested. And, and that, that if they do that for marijuana, the marijuana thing's going to drop way off because uh, uh, as many of us who used to drink pretty much knew that when Mothers Against Drunk Driving uh, started getting the government to crack down on drunk driving and put some of these drunks in jail, the, uh, a lot of people backed away from that kind of activity and, and it, it caused a kind of mini depression amongst a lot of joints that used to uh, entertain the population and make them all a little um, dangerous missiles uh, toward the end of the work day. So that's two things. Uh, drug test the kids and and add the, the testing, forensic testing of uh, the presence of, of marijuana and, and other these mind altering substances uh, among violent criminals. So that's that's it. Thanks a lot for having me on, by the way. This was oh, you're welcome. Session. You're welcome. Now, so I think it's about time to wrap up. So I just want to ask everybody if there's something you think urgently should have been said that we haven't said or raised, you can raise your hand or um, yell. Yes, David. Uh, yeah, one thing, uh, uh, 
in New Jersey, we put on a campaign after marijuana was legalized to get towns to opt out. And we contacted all the, uh, most of the, the cities and municipalities there, 71% opted out in New Jersey. And I know there's a campaign now to do that in New York. So uh, I would urge you to do that. We, we got most of the state decided to opt out in New Jersey. Great, thank you. We absolutely should do that. Yes, Bishop James. Also, the um, the lie that's being told that folks are going to um, get out of prison. Um, they need to understand that if you've been charged at, under the federal law as a drug dealer, you're not getting out, you're going to do the time. And as was said, that no one for smoking a joint went to prison. And so that's the lie being told. Um, and, and, and the last thing, the last thing, for every mother, every mother, and this is going to go up, uh, across the spectrum, social, economic, um, ethnicity, in the state of New Jersey, you're going to be tested for a federal controlled substance. If you come back dirty, it's a good possibility that you're going to have a child welfare case and your employer has to be notified. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dennis Small, yes. We should unfreeze the funds of the Afghanistan Central Bank, which our Treasury Department has illegally and very injudiciously frozen. Uh, if you want to push a country which today produces 80% of the world's opium crop back into the waiting arms of the international drug trade, or the claws rather than arms, the simplest way to do that is to make sure that the country has absolutely no other access to funds than the drug trade. The policy of the United States government, the policy of the EU towards Afghanistan at this point is totally uh, crazy and criminal. We are starving that country to death by denying them access to their own financial funds, whatever we think of their government. And you know, that's, that's not the point. It's the money of Afghanistan. And they are being denied access to banking and financial transactions, which are baseline requirements for pulling back 22 million people who are at the edge of starvation, of dying of starvation this year. If you want to create the world center of the drug problem, uh, even more than it has been so far, just continue with the policy we have today. We should absolutely immediately unfreeze those funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd really like to thank all of you here for uh, participating in this. And I would, uh, myself like to encourage everybody both on the panel and people listening to visit the schillerinstitute.com or yeah .com website uh, there was a conference of the schiller institute this past weekend which was quite extraordinary with four panels on these matters saying that all of the moral forces of mankind have to be mobilized to deal with the crisis the fourth panel on Sunday, which I moderated, dealt with the question of culture and education. Uh, it was quite powerful. Uh, and the first panel dealt with the overall strategic crisis, which is also extremely dangerous. I will say as a candidate for public office, I think it is not a good thing to have elected officials, particularly if they have a say in whether we're going to go to war at not, or not mentally impaired by substance abuse. And I'm afraid we have far too many cases of that right now. Uh, so I would urge people to watch the Schiller Institute conference. And if you can help my campaign, we are going to need, if the law doesn't change, uh, and people know there was a change sneaked into the budget in New York, that mandates that independent candidates have to get 45,000 signatures to get on the ballot within a six week period. If that's not changed, it's going to be between April and May of next year. And I need you. So please sign up at sarefersenate.com to volunteer. 
to donate, to take the New Federalist newspaper to distribute. I'd like to take some excerpts of the program we had tonight and get them into print and in circulation because I think there's a lot here that people don't know. So thank you. Thank you all for joining me and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.